the reason it kind of happened was that in 1992, when I um, was going through the process of working in hedge fund sales in fixed income at uh, Goldman Sachs, I was interviewing for that position. And I got to the final round and the head of my desk was going to be a lady called Noreen Harrington. And Noreen wanted me on the desk, was a, a, you know, a wonderful sponsor of mine within the, uh, ever since the first interview stages. And she, um, in my last interview, after my last interview the day before, she'd said, just come in tomorrow and the partner will sign you off and welcome to the team. And the next day um, I come in and she goes, I'm sorry, Brace uh, uh, is not uh, in today. He's got the flu or something. But there's a partner in from uh, New York called Chip Selig and he will do your interview. I'm just imagining my life at Goldman Sachs and you know, all the stories I've heard, you know, the, the time in you know, the US as a graduate, you know, just wild stories. And I'm like completely pumped up. And um, I walk in and I sit down and I'm like just imagining myself on the floor, etc. And then this guy walks in and my heart sinks. Because I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you here, but uh, I don't know if you've ever met someone in your life and you look at them and you know they hate you on sight. And there is nothing you can do. Nothing at all. You haven't breathed yet wrong, but just disliked me. And he sat down opposite me, and I still maintain it was the best interview I ever gave. I knew every answer. I was sincere. I looked at him. I did everything right. And every few seconds, he would go like this. It was soul crushing. And then he finally gets up and leaves. And Noreen is standing outside the glass door, and she starts saying to him, yes? And he goes, no. And she goes, what do you mean, no? And she raised her voice. Now I can hear it. He goes, I don't think he's suitable for the position. He goes, it's not your desk, it's my desk. I think he is suitable. And they start arguing. And I'm sitting there, 23-year-old boy, with his whole life in the balance, going, Noreen, come on, win this argument, just this one. And uh, after that, I, got, I swear, I think it was like 10 minutes. It seemed like 10 minutes to me, maybe it was less. She walks in, shoulders slumped, and goes, Mazafra, I'm so sorry. Um, we can't hire you, but if I ever get the chance to hire you again, I will. And I walked out and I was so angry. I was like, typical, you know, GS, this is crap. I was so angry. And uh, then, May, May 1997, the day that uh, Farid, my ex-boss, gives me this contract at English Trust saying um, 13,000 pounds a year and where am I gonna go? That night was the worst, that evening, was the worst of my life and I was thinking of calling my dad up and saying, you were right, I'm an idiot, I should have come back to Pakistan, I'm ready to pack up my bags and come and work in the civil service in Pakistan. And I get a call from Noreen Harrington and she says, I've just joined Barclays as a global head of fixed income, I didn't forget my promise, you're going to come work for us. And you know, the moments like that happen in your life and it's like a movie and it's like, I'm not going to repeat what I said on camera to my boss next day about what he could do with his contract. Uh, but that was amazing. Um, and so I started at uh, Barclays, right? Because the very bank that I was cursing was the one that kept its promise. A Goldman Sachs woman kept her promise, you know? So it tells you that you completely misread people and they you know, you have to give people a bit of a doubt and you've got to keep going, you know. So I turn up at Barclays and a few days later, randomly, um, I meet a colleague of Noreen's, Mark Cheval. And um, he is um, in a lunch queue. And we start talking and then we realize that he was a year ahead of me at LSE. And I'd seen him around at LSE. And we had a friend in common, a guy called uh, Amir Mir. And uh, so uh, we were like, oh yeah, and, you know, how are you, etc. We started talking. And then Mark started giving me some research projects, you know, do this for us, do that for us, etc. And I started doing them. And um, like three months later, I think it was August um, of uh, 1997, 
uh, Mark and his proprietary team, he'd come over as the head of proprietary trading for Barclays from Goldman. They called the Asian crisis, right? And made Barclays over $100 million, a huge amount of money for Barclays in those days. They'd never seen that kind of money from a trading desk. But more significantly, on a daily basis, in terms of client coverage, he was talking to a gentleman called Lewis Bacon, who was head of more capital management at that time, the third largest hedge fund in the world. And he had made Lewis, through his advice, hundreds of millions. So Lewis was a big fan of Mark and said, come over. And Mark took half the team, Mark going him, to more capital. But in the same way that Noreen kept faith with me, Mark had always said to me that if you do this work for me for free, I won't forget you. And when he went to more capital, he uh, asked to hire me. And, uh, and he did. 